lecturer of English and Feminist Evolutionary Studies at Lincoln University, where he also serves as the director of the speech and debate team. He earned a PhD in English from Binghamton University and has published essays on technology and apocalypse, environmental securitization, disability studies, and the influence of science fiction on reality. Joe serves on the executive board for the Institute of Critical Animal Studies and served as the North American representative for the Institute from 2013 to 2015 um, after, before becoming a member of the executive Tonight, he argues for ethical compassion and sustainable agriculture through a liberationist poetics in opposition to environmental politics. He contends that this will ultimately lead to more productive ecological awareness and policy. Joe, welcome. else 
out there that we cannot predict. And part of what it means to have a greater understanding of compassion is beginning to let go of that belief that we can control everything within the planet and recognize that when we try and manage things, very often there is unattended consequences that we don't think about in the beginning. And so by moving away from this approach where all we think about is rational ways to affect the world and start thinking about our emotional connections to the world, we can start beginning to consider those alternative ways and those other unintended consequences that may emerge as a result. This oftentimes happens when people, instead of having emotions, put forth a capitalist or a utilitarian logic where the goal is for the greater good opposed to a form of social justice. This notion of a greater good is always looking out for majoritarian interest, what's good for those who count, and always works to the exclusion of the minoritarian interests, because those who are not part of the greater good are seemingly inconsequential to what we're considered. In terms of the environment, many times what counts as the greater good doesn't ever count the non-human world or those other animals that are affected by human intervention or policies that go about taking place. Because it ultimately becomes a way of how can we get money how can we let the rivers, the forests last another day so that way we can have more things to build more houses in order to reap more benefits from it, opposed to trying to figure out why, what should we be doing and why should we be doing this? My argument is that this form of utilitarian logic replicates a, a, a formulation of thought that always views nature as a resource. And a lot of the problems that we have on the planet is that it traces back to viewing nature as a resource or animals people as a resource. Even terms like human resources assume that the value that we give in our productivity is about our productivity as a resource, opposed to recognizing our intrinsic value as being human and being able to relate to one another. So we have to begin to move away from viewing animals, plants, and people as resources, but rather viewing the intrinsic value that exists within them. Indeed, Professor of Humanities at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, Roger Gottlieb, mm -hmm. argues the anthropocentric perspectives of conservation and liberal environmentalism cannot take us far enough. Our relations with non-human nature are poisoned, and not just because we have set up feedback loops that already lead to mass starvation, skyrocketing environmental disease rates, and devastation of natural resources. Instead, we must develop a new form of ethics, where we do not begin from the uniqueness of our human selfhood, existing as against a taken perpetual <coughs> background of the earth and sky. Nor is our body somehow irrelevant to ethical relations, with knowledge of it always reduced to tactics of domination. Our knowledge does not assimilate the other to the same, but reveals and furthers the continuing dance of our interdependence. And our ethical motivation is neither rationalist system nor an individualist self-interest, but a sense of connection to all life. Thus, in my speech, I advocate for a liberationist poetics when approaching agriculture in opposition to an anthropocentric politics of exclusivity based on rationality. To me, a liberationist poetics means three things. First, it means a refusal to accept human dominion over the non-human world, even as we participate in it. And so what I mean by that is that we have to stop viewing ourselves at the top of a hierarchy, or at the top of the food chain, where we assume that we know best, and that our actions are to be able to control the rest of the world of those who fall below us within that food chain. The second thing that liberation poetics requires is that there is an emphasis on always doing more, instead of assuming our actions toward the environment and animal others have gone far enough. Being vegan is never an end point. It's always a process, because there's always more that can be done in order to reach a greater form of liberation than just sort of stopping and saying we've gone far enough in our actions. There's always something more that can be done to make the world a better place, and social justice requires us to continuously struggle. Even when reforms are implemented to make the world better, if we sit down and stop struggling for the next form of change, we'll never reach the actual, the actual end point that we want to reach. And the third thing in liberation as poetics requires is a reliance on a relationality to others instead of an abstraction of data under the guise of objectivity. We have to begin to relate to each other as creatures on this planet, opposed to as people who assume that they are omnipotent in their control of this planet. Now, I think this is important in terms of framing the discussion in relationship to a localitarian argument. A lot of times when I have discussions with people who you know, are against factory farming but are not against meat eating in general, they bring up arguments for why we should have local consumption, why local consumption of animal agriculture would be better than, uh, than eating like vegan products that are shipped across the world. And there's a lot of sympathy I have to this argument because certainly globalized systems of capitalism 
that have used the same sort of like industrial agriculture to produce soybeans is also part of the problem that leads to the destruction of the environment. At the same time, I don't think just eating local is ever enough to actually free us from the very utilitarian concerns that allow for the destruction of the environment in the first place. So in terms of localitarianism, there is an overlap with that and my uh, liberation poetics. It meets my third condition insofar as it enables a closer relationship to our food and the animal others that build our connection. When one goes to a local farm and chooses to eat a cow from that local farm, there's at least a moment of connection where they see that bean that they're about to consume, so that way they can develop a relationship and at least have an understanding from where they come from and what it means to then go ahead and slaughter their animal. However, localitarianism fails in the other two instances. In the instance of my first connection, it assumes that we have, that humans have the inherent right and knowledge to manage and control the living being. I believe that if one really looked into the eyes of a cow or a pig, the next step would not be young, but rather the next step should be, how can I form a better relationship where my survival and the pig or the cow's survival could be interdependent so that way we can make the world a better place, opposed to predicating my relationship with that animal based upon the ultimate end point where that animal will end up on a dinner plate. It also fails in the, con on the second context, since it assumes the possibility of a humane slaughter instead of looking for a world where killing other animals is no longer necessary. The notion of a humane slaughter in my mind is fundamentally contradictory to what it means to be humane in the first place. To think that we could have a equal relationship where we treat others with respect and simultaneously say, well, I know I'm gonna kill you at the end of the day, it is fundamentally an incoherent argument. If you apply this to human politics, People who thought that there were good slave owners and bad slave owners because some gave them more free time after they worked the fields or they gave them bigger living quarters doesn't make sense because to own slaves is fundamentally unethical. Same thing in terms of rape. There is no humane form of rape that could take place. Whether someone is conscious or unconscious, it does not justify the violence that takes place. Same thing with animal agriculture. It becomes impossible to humanely relate to non-human animals if that relationship is always predicated on the destruction and the extermination of the other at the end of the day without assuming the interests of that other. In this regard, feminist vegetarian scholar Carol Adams writes, as long as man kills the lower races for food or sport, he will be ready to kill his own race for enmity. It is not this bloodshed or that bloodshed that must cease, but all needless bloodshed, all wanton infliction of pain or death upon fellow beings. The front exists not only in traditionally viewed warfare, but also in the war against non-human animals typified in hunting and meat eating. Wars will never cease, will men still kill other animals for food, since to turn any living creature into a roast, a steak, a chop, or any other form of meat takes the same kind of violence, the same kind of bloodshed, and the same kind of mental processes required to change a living man into a dead soldier. This returns to my argument about hierarchical ordering and the value of life inherent in utilitarian politics. Once we think that our lives are more important than the lives of others, then we can utilize those others for whatever we deem necessary. And while some people might think, well, I still need to eat, so at some point I need to kill something, that killing of animals that we have that relationship is not one of the killings that is fundamentally necessary to stay in our lives. Rather, we can be able to consume other things. So when I engage with people who are meat eaters and don't really have a care for other forms of politics, they're often like, well, a lion eats meat, so why can't I also eat? There is a difference between a lion that is biologically programmed that is unable to survive without the practices of eating other animals and humans who have evolved to the point where we can survive without eating other animals and can eat plant life. I have a whole other series of friends who say, well, if you eat animals, aren't you then also, or if you eat plants, aren't, isn't that also just unethical because you think we should have a larger form of ethics? Yes, I do think we should have a respect and intrinsic value to all forms of natural life, but the fact is, when we engage with animal agriculture, not only do the plants get destroyed in order to create feed for the animals, we then also create another level of violence, killing those animals in a process that becomes increasingly unsustainable because of the grain and the resources and the land that gets taken up as a result, which will be a point that I will return to later. This is also why my advocacy for a liberationist poetic is not the same as Peter Singer's approach for using utilitarianism as a basis for animal liberation. Peter Singer uses things like consciousness and sentience in order to justify what we should deem more of, that we should give moral consideration and those creatures that we shouldn't give moral consideration. He has in several moments defended that people with mental deficiencies, it is okay to do experimentations on them because those results are more extrapolatable to humans because they're humans and since they have a lower sentience than a lot of the animals that go through animal laboratories, it makes more sense for him 
tests on humans with mental deficiencies who don't have a higher form of cognition than, say, an orangutan. My argument is that that is also fundamentally unethical because we shouldn't be drawing our line to compassion based upon the intelligence of the species or how similar one is to ourselves. The fact that he has said that it is better for us to euthanize and kill babies that don't have a degree of sentience and will not be able to develop is an unethical advocacy because those forms of advocacy return to a ranking of how we can determine who is better and who is less, who is deserving of life and who is not. My argument is that everything is inherently deserving of life, and in doing so, we have to always take into consideration how we relate to those others in a result. My argument is also not the same as deep ecology movements that think that we have to view everything in the planet within a, some sort of natural ecosystem because the concept of how we understand nature is also a human derivative. Again, Gottlieb writes, deep ecology upon closer examination appears to be fundamentally anthropocentric since it requires meaning through its connection to human ideals, human thought, and human values. According to deep ecology, human individuals will only realize themselves and achieve the highest levels of satisfaction and fulfillment by the, by the complementary realization of all living things and natural beings. Each individual human is to conceive of him or herself as part of the more comprehensive self that comprises the whole world. In practice, then, we will work to preserve ourselves, human individuals, and our own flourishing. In harming the interests of our natural world, we harm ourselves, deep ecologists say. The focus of this preservation on natural processes is a maximization of human interest. Sadly, even this attempt to escape egoism only succeeds because we are identifying ourselves with the universe through an anthropocentric notion and a comparison of ourselves to the individual. Likewise, localitarians almost always make use of either utilitarianism or deep ecology to justify the consumption of animals. In the first case, localitarians often argue that on a utilitarian basis, it is better to eat meat that is produced locally than it is to source things globally. Or they say, we are part of a natural environment, and so therefore we exist within a food chain, and so naturally it makes sense for us to be able to eat animals like a lion would. In both these cases, it uses a human vantage point in order to be able to determine what makes sense, which is why such approaches are ultimately doomed to fail, since the only yardstick of measurement that they utilize is distinctly human, which means it becomes fundamentally impossible to have a larger orientation in which we can care for the rest of the world and the natural environments that we exist in. Only when we get rid of the human yardstick of understanding does it become possible to do things like preserve the environment for the sake of the environment itself, opposed to turning the environment into a utility for us to consume. To this end, Stephen Best, professor of philosophy at the University of Texas writes, although since the 1970s, the left has begun to seriously address the nature question, they have universally failed to grasp that the animal question that lies at the core of the social and ecological issues. Critiques of human arrogance over and alienation from nature calls for a reharmonization of society with ecology and an emphasis on a new ethics that focuses solely on the physical world apart from the millions of animal species it contains. This is specious, myopic, and inadequate. It's as if everyone could get on board with respecting rivers and mountains, but still want to eat, experiment on, wear, and be entertained by animals. Left ecological concerns stem not from any kind of deep respect for the natural world, but rather from a position of enlightenment anthropocentrism that understands how important a sustainable environment is for human existence. It is a more difficult matter to understand the crucial role animals play in sustaining ecosystems and how animal exploitation often has dramatic environmental consequences, let alone more complex issues such as the relationships between violence toward animals and violence toward other human beings. Moreover, it is far easier to respect nature through recycling, planting trees, or driving hybrid cars and is respect animals by becoming a vegan who stops eating and wearing animal bodies in their products. This returns to the two differences that I pointed out earlier between a liberationist poetic and an anthropocentric environmental, environmental politics. First, again, we recognize how the question of respecting nature returns to the question of human dominion within a localitarian movement because it becomes how do we become better stewards to the environment in order to protect the environment for our own interests, opposed to figuring out what we could do in a larger sense in order to create a social relationship that promotes a true form of justice. And second, there's not a larger push for a greater form of expanded compassion for doing more. If our compassion ends at driving hybrid cars, or planting trees, or recycling, all of which, which are clearly good efforts that we should engage in, realism that is necessary in order to confront the capitalist ideologies that are just winning the war against the environment, because more people think that if, I, if it's easy and if it's good for me, then that's all I need to do. If I just consume whatever I want and put the bottles in the recycling bin, then that's good enough. 
opposed to recognizing that the root of the problem becomes a question of consumption and capitalism to say we should stop buying the drinks to recycle the bottles and start using reusable bottles. And even that becomes not enough because we have to continuously push more and do more. The problem with both libertarians and traditional forms of vegan politics is that any action becomes an endpoint, opposed to a process, a, a continual process of struggle. When I parallel this with the current Black Lives Matter campaigns that are going on and current forms of other social justice movements that happen, a lot of people think, well, haven't we done enough? Hasn't there been civil rights? Don't we have an African American president? How come this hasn't addressed these injustices? Well, it has been a step in the right direction. Clearly those steps are not enough because there are other unconscious forms of racism that continue to affect the planet and affect the way they relate to one another. To simply say, well, I'll eat meat only if it's produced locally and I won't go ahead and buy factory farm meat doesn't stop the violence that's done to the animals who are slaughtered because animals are still getting killed at the end of the day. It doesn't stop the environmental destruction if all we think that we need to do is clean up our rivers but not address are the consumption patterns that give rise to the pollution in the first place. The struggle must always be long, larger, and if all we do is relate to things rationally, we're never gonna have a deeper form of compassion that could go beyond that. Quoting Stephen Best again, he says, a truly revolutionary social theory and movement will not just emancipate members of one species, but rather all species and the earth itself. A future revolutionary moment worthy of its name will grasp the ancient conceptual roots of hierarchy and domination to incorporate a new ethics of environmental and animal rights that overcomes instr instrumentalism and hierarchical thinking in every pernicious form. This is important not just for the environment and not human species, but for our connection to other human animal, humans as well. Anthropocentric hierarchies often inform other axes of domination. The fact that in colonial periods, it was easy for Europeans to enslave and slaughter Africans, indigenous people, started with the precursor that they were not human. Somehow they were savages. Somehow they weren't intelligent. Somehow they were dehumanized because to not be human or not be fully human was enough of a precursor and justification to lead way for their domination, for their destruction. In the world where we believe instead that all creatures are fundamentally equal, to be human makes us no better than other animals. Rather, it becomes a process for us to be able to dismantle the process of dehumanization so that way being dehumanized does not necessarily become a negative connotation because not to be human is not fundamentally problematic. My argument is that also, once we allow for anthropocentric hierarchies to enter into our way of thinking, these beliefs also become self-perpetuating because they continuously create the belief that we know best and we can be able to hit, put forward a effective control of the world. And so if we happen to discriminate against someone, whether human or animal, that is less than us, that's okay because it's for the better interest of myself or more important because my interests matter more than the other individuals whose lives I'm willing to sacrifice. This is also why reformism alone fails because reformism becomes an endpoint of taking single steps without figuring out the larger leaps that need to be made. Of course, I'd also like to take a minute to address the supposed science behind libertarianism, which has been increasingly proved faulty. Voss Staniskew, who's an assistant professor of communication studies at Mercer University, contends that while we find that although food transport at long distances in general, the greenhouse emissions associated with food are dominated by the production phase, contributing 83% of the average US, US household CO2 output. Transportation as a whole represents only 11% of emissions, with final delivery from producer to retailer only 4%. Thus, a dietary shift can be a more effective means of lowering an average household food-related climate footprint than buying local. Shifting less than one day per week's worth of calories from red meat and dairy, fish and eggs to a vegetable-based diet achieves more greenhouse gas reduction than buying all locally sourced food. This conclusion makes sense when we consider the United Nations Intergovernmental Planet, the Panel on Climate Change findings, that meat production contributes more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation industry, including all automobiles combined. In fact, recent research suggests that organic free-range animals may, in specific cases, be more harmful to the environment than animals raised conventionally. For example, data, re data released in 2007 show that when all factors are considered, organic free-range chickens have a 20% greater impact on global warming than conventional raised broiler birds. That's because sustainable chickens take longer to raise and eat more feed. While local boards imagine all factory farms eventually turning into more sustainable small-scale family farms, that ideal is simply not physically possible given the world's current rate of meat consumption. Over 55 billion land animals are raised and slaughtered every year worldwide for human consumption. This rate of slaughter already consumes 30% of the Earth's entire land surface and accounts for a staggering 80% of the total land utilized by humans. 
In addition to the problems of sustainability, meat consumption also entails a massive loss of biodiversity, which ironically would be increased by a shift to local-based diets as even more land would be, have to be set aside for free-range grazing. To summarize these findings, Locatarianism fails as an environmental practice because one, CO2 produced from animal agriculture is significantly larger than CO2 produced from transportation, demonstrating that it is not so-called food miles that are the result of the problem, but rather there's a production phase that goes into feeding those animals, cutting down the trees, and creating the grazing lands necessary to sustain them. Two, it is literally unsustainable at current consumption rates, so if the locatarian arguments were to succeed, it, the, pre, the first step that has to be taken is already a decrease in meat consumption because if we continue to kill 55 billion animals per year without the factory farm methods, it becomes unsustainable as a land use practice in order to be able to shift that all to a local diet. So a precursor for localitarianism to succeed, whether it be through vegetables and soybeans or through animals, still requires a decrease on people of their meat consumption. Three, it is not only less efficient in terms of CO2 emissions and simply cutting out meat altogether, but also assumes it is also sometimes even more inefficient than factory farms. And it is surprising that anything could be worse than factory farms in any condition. And I would certainly say, if you're interacting with someone, that it would be way better to go to a local farm for you to be able to help local farmers, be able to sustain local economies, and be able to have the intimate connections that eat from factory farms. But the fact that science shows that in some conditions, factory farms are more efficient and produce less health greenhouse gases than local forms of animal, uh, animal production should really give pause to the question of people who say, well, if I eat local, I'm doing good for the environment. Because there's always something more that can be done, good, done better for the environment. And fourth, it will continue to use land use for agriculture at the expense of other environmental considerations. Moreover, my call for a liberation poetics is also not without its science as well. In fact, it has been found that removing anthropocentric viewpoints from environmental policy would do a lot more in way of preserving the environment than furthering current species notions of human dominion. To this end, Eric Katz, Vice President of the International Society for Environmental Ethics, and Lauren Oshwali, who received her MS in Biology and Ecology from Montana State University, write, environmental policy decisions do not merely concern the trade-off in comparison of various human benefits. If preservationist policies are to be justified without a loss of equity, we must reject the anthropocentric and instrumental framework for policy decisions. This alternative represents a shift in philosophical worldview. When the non-anthropocentric framework is introduced, it creates a more complex situation for deliberation and resolution. Of course, some human interests will not be fulfilled. Nevertheless, the same can be said of all ethical decisions. Nevertheless, environmentalists can escape the dilemma if they reject the normative framework of anthropocentric instrumental rationality. A set of obligations directed to nature in its own right makes many questions of human benefits and satisfactions irrelevant. Once we move beyond the confines of human-based instrumental goods, the environmentalist position is thereby justified and no policy dilemma is created. This conclusion serves as an indirect justification of a non-anthropocentric system of normative ethics, avoiding problems in environmental policy that a human-based ethic cannot. To stand with deliberationist poetics, therefore necessitates a certain degree of intrinsic respect for the environment and all creatures uh, that inhabit it versus only those who meet rationalist demands of a utilitarian logic. I'd also like to carve out some exceptions to my speech uh, that distinguish the liberationist poetics from the, ve uh, from the vegan campaigns that are promoted by groups like PETA and Mercy for Animals. Uh, most of those campaigns, a lot of them I fundamentally disagree with, even if I agree with some of the endpoints that they're pushing for, the way that they go about doing it ends up also resulting in the same problems that I see with a lot of Peter Singer's approach. In the first instance, a lot of these groups don't pay attention to food deserts or classes uh, or class-based uh, access to who has access to be able to have a vegan diet and who has access to be able to gain uh, the ability to move away from these things. It also does put, it begins to put the blame on farmers, factory farm workers, people living in poverty, because it assumes that anyone who consumes an animal is fundamentally immoral. And while yes, I said at the beginning of my speech to consume animals is unethical, that onus is not on people whose livelihoods depend on utilizing animals, nor that onus on people who don't have the ability to get to anywhere besides the gas station or McDonald's to eat. Rather, the onus are on the people with privilege to be able to restructure the way we relate to others and the institutions to alter the conditions that make those things impossible. Food insecurity and obesity is fundamentally linked. The way that food insecurity also perpetuates things like the consumption of animals because of what people have access to is something that we have to address before we could go to poor neighborhoods and say, hey, you should be vegan, even though the 
processes and the network set up aren't possible for them to do that currently. And that's something that people with privilege, which you know I have as a professor at Binghamton University, I'm able to utilize to try and figure out ways to navigate this to make those situations better, opposed to putting the blame and the onus on others. Second, it means that it is possible to have intimate relationships with either sheep or egg-laying chickens or goats that one lives with. I used to live with chickens for a fair, uh, for several years of my life, and I did consume the eggs and gave the eggs to my children. But when they stopped laying those eggs, I didn't kill them in order to be able to eat them. I allowed them to continue to live out their life. Because to me, while they produced eggs that weren't fertilized, that that form of relationship was one that was symbiotic, that did not necessitate the result and the murder of them at the end of the day just for uh, consumption, but rather became a, a nuanced relationship. I believe you can do the same with a lot of other local farm animals if the, point is, if the end point is not, well, when they stop being productive for me, I'm gonna kill them because all that matters is their own productive productivity for myself. And so it is possible to have some sort of animals within agriculture, but only when we consider the value and the, what the, is in the animal's interest as well. And third, is that we have to constantly have a reflexivity for mistakes. It is impossible in today's society to be purely vegan, because no matter what you're going to do, whether you, you have to take medicine, or whether you put petroleum in your car, or any number of other things, you're always gonna be consuming animals to one extent or the other. But we should not allow that to serve as an excuse to not continue to do more, which is precisely the second point that I got to in terms of a liberation of poetic, but we always have to do uh, continual struggles to make the world a better place. Otherwise, we end up failing because a vegan who continues to consume Coca-Cola products and continues to you know, buy soy milk from, from Walmart continues to perpetuate in, in damaging things in terms socially as well as environmentally because Walmart's practices are anything but environmental. And while it's sort of nice that I could travel almost anywhere in this country and be able to find soy milk to put in my coffee, it is not, eth it's not ethical for me to utilize that privilege to go to a Walmart just so I can have the coffee the way I would like to have it. Rather, I could live with my coffee being black if there is not a more ethical form of creamer that I could utilize in that result. I do not have to have creamer if I feel that that cream comes from a cow that I feel that was exploited. So it becomes a situation where by pressing to always do more, we don't stop just because we think that we have done something. Doing something is good, but it's never enough. I'd also like to bracket this conversation a little further, because none of this is to deny the, process, the, the practices of localitarianism in general. Quoting Vasquez-Kanescu again, he points out that there is no doubt that urban community gardening, farmers markets, community-supported agriculture, and organic farms with the sheer the use of monocrop, monoculture crops, pesticides, and treat their workers well are important goals which local, local warism helps to forward. The trouble with the local poor movement, however, is that it continues to articulate itself on the basis of a false dichotomy between vegans and vegetarians on the one hand and conscious food consumers on the other, as though it were impossible to be concerned about the welfare of animals, the environment, and the broader questions of food policy and food justice at the, at the same time. In sum, the false dichotomy between the vegan and the local can be ended so that both animal rights activists and food policy activists can unite into a shared and therefore more effective movement. We must build on the growing consensus on the need for more than just a just diet, but to do so in a way that addresses the full panoply of social justice issues that a truly just and green diet must entail. Ultimately, the solution to our environmental politics must avoid repeating the same epistemological mistakes of past approaches. This requires producing new ontological orientations to how we come to understand the world, as well as what counts as a grievable death or a valuable life in the first place. Only by freeing ourselves from the shackles of rationalism can we produce a new form of environmental awareness that would have the possibility of preventing future ecological catastrophe. Therefore, I would like to conclude my talk with a poem by Kenneth Caesar titled The Murder of Richard Brown. March the 3rd, 1985, that's the last he was seen alive. Three-year-old Richard Brown was kidnapped from home. No one there could stop them, he was all alone. He could hardly move as they locked him in a cage along with many others, all of the same age. All he now could do was cry upon his fate. No one now could save him, now it was too late. April 6th, 1987, they took him to another room, the time was sharp 11. He gave a loud scream, head was cut off with the knife, in agony he ended his short unhappy life. As if this was not enough of a story of gore, the killer's sadism asked for much more. They skinned him down upon the bloody floor and to bits and pieces him they tore. The killers, though discovered, were never put in prison, 
no trial and no verdict, no guilty decision. This is a true story, though I use a false name. The victim was a rabbit, not a boy, but the pain remains the same. Thank you. Okay, so how do we want to do this? Uh, we can either have Jerry open it up to or open it up to discussion. I'll do that. So uh, Joe, do you want to stay up there or join us? Either here. Either here. Uh, let's, let's keep you up there. <laughs> okay. Yes? Just a simple question at first. The name of the first poem and the author? Uh, it was Beth Levine and it was titled When This Day Comes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. Would you please uh, comment on um, how to feed the growing billions of humans on the earth? You know, in the you know in the system that you describe, should we ever be able to achieve it? We I have, have to feed them and uh, yeah, and make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it. Uh, Feeding people become more sustainable the more that we move away from animal agriculture. I've seen all sorts of statistics, you know, in my backpack I got a bunch of sites, but like in general, it seems to be that you need to use about somewhere between five, five to 10 times the amount of grain to produce an equivalent amount of calories for uh, meat consumption. And so if we shifted instead of feeding the animals to then feed ourselves to eating the grain and the vegetables themselves, that would be more likely in order to be able to create a sustainable diets for everyone because it shifts what we're able to consume and what we're able to, what we're able to eat. I also think that uh, within, in terms of like liberation poetics, we should also question sort of like how we eat and what we consume and to the degree that we consume, right? Certainly within Americanized culture, there is sort of a gluttony of food waste as well as a willingness to just sort of like consume to the point of over overeating just because we like the taste of things, opposed to recognizing that, well, certainly food tastes good and I wanna eat, that we don't need to do it for our own sort of values, but that we should do it based upon uh, what's necessary in order to be able to create create that ethical relationship. So if my food eating is taking away from the, what other people can eat, that becomes uh, becomes a problem. But I think a lot of the questions of uh, food consumption is a lot of times a question of distribution, where we need to sort of change the way that we distribute food to people, uh, so that way it's not like it's all stuck within first world affluent neighborhoods, but begin to redistribute it. Like, to me, it seems like absurd that in Vestal, uh, at the intersection by Walmart, there are uh, four different grocery stores that you, where people can consume from, from you know, any number of different things, and they all carry the same product, but that's where the food concentration is because that's where the money is. Whereas when you go to the north side of Binghamton, you can hardly find a grocery store without you know, a long distance of travel. And so the problem with that is because the people who open grocery stores are more interested in making money opposed to getting food to people who deserve it. And so I think that if we sort of shift the focus to sort of the institutional ways that food are distributed and people get access to that food, it's gonna be easier for us to be able to gain access. And so things like community gardens, community farming, CSAs, all those sort of things are a necessary step to get food to populations who aren't able to gain access to that. And utilizing food stamps as a way that people can get access to CSA as opposed to only utilizing food stamps in that regards is important. And I know that like, that's something that like Vines Gardens worked on doing is utilizing those food stamps so that way people can participate in local agriculture opposed to allowing that being something that only affluent people can do. So, I mean, I, I think we agree on a lot of these ideas about food justice social justice in general, uh, but uh, just to drill down a little bit more on the animal agriculture, you know, I do agree that it takes a huge amount of fossil fuels to uh, produce the corn and other grains that are then processed into animal feed, um, but that's not the kind of animal agriculture that I've I practice actually. I don't feed any grain, any uh, concentrates except when I want to give them the treat to lure them into the handling system, and then it's that's just medicine. My sheep eat only grass. It doesn't take any fossil fuel to produce that. It's very low cost environmentally and financially. It's what the animals prefer and it's what they really 
to invest on. And so, um, and there are plenty of places in the world, in Argentina, for example, where the, the cattle raising and sheep raising, even in New Zealand, the sheep raising is all on, on range, on grass. They, they don't harvest. You know, I mean, this feeding grain to animals is really an American phenomenon. I mean, maybe it's spreading around the world. That's really an American phenomenon. I mean, Americans basically feed their food livestock the way they feed their pets, the way they feed themselves, which is with concentrated feed. So I, I have a little bit of a problem with that concept. And uh, also, uh, if we're to eliminate animal agriculture and all human beings on the earth were to nourish themselves with, uh, I mean, were to procure protein through legumes and beans and things like that, well, we would have to expand the amount of land that's devoted to that kind of agriculture. And that means killing up the land, making the land bare of vegetation, and then planting it, and then fertilizing it, and you end up with uh, lifeless soil that does not uh, sequester carbon. And there's a big environmental cost in doing that as opposed to uh, grazing your protein, producing your protein by grazing, and I don't mean overgrazing, I mean managed grazing, where that land, instead of tilling it up, is always green. Okay, if you go look at my pastures right now, they're still green, we're in the middle of November. And if you go look at a cornfield, it's all brown. So my point is that that cornfield right now is basically bare earth. It's not sequestering any carbon. It's not taking that greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere, funneling it through a green leaf and back into the soil. Whereas my pastures and other pastures that are managed properly are still sequestering carbon dioxide. Uh, so. I mean, in all these studies that you've cited, have they taken those factors into consideration? And there's another thing I would like to point out, and that is that if we all went from, if we eliminated ruminant agriculture, and thereby eliminated all the carbon dioxide and methane gas that they produce, well, we'd all have to eat beans. Well. We ferment too, <laughs> not, not in ruins, but in our hind gut. And of course, we don't produce uh, individually. I mean, I don't produce myself as much methane and carbon dioxide as one of my sheep does. But there are a lot more humans than there are sheep and cattle in the world. And you know, somebody's got to uh, crunch those numbers and see how much more methane that humans will put out and then carbon dioxide if we all ate beans and, uh, uh, as a replacement of all um, animal protein. Yeah, I mean, so I, I agree with a lot of what you end up saying, because certainly like current practices like corn and soy farming that is done uh, in that, you know, when you drive around seeing is an unsustainable form of farming. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is also driven by subsidies that are given uh, which then also function as like handouts to capos that then you know buy that grain and everything like that, and so to just continuously plant corn in the same place again and again is certainly not an environmental practice that I would you know, I would be in favor of. I do think that there are ways to avoid that by using adequate crop rotations. Using hemp is one part of the solution that people have done that is able to restore nutrients as well as then continue the carbon sequestration to take it out of to continue to work on the carbon when we are not growing food in those areas, and then we can utilize hemp for other things like whether it be paper, plastics, or threads that becomes another alternative from other industrialized forms. Um, and I certainly recognize that there are farmers, uh, both within the US and also globally, that do use this sort of free, uh, you know, free range grazing where animals are able to graze and it's not done with concentrated feed. 
but there are also plenty of examples of where the free grazing that takes place starts with the periods of deforestation. And so like my major example of that is like the Maasai people who utilize cows as a form of the, uh, uh, as a form of economy, but then also as a form of nutrients. And even though they are often, uh, oftentimes a nomadic people, what they do as they move from place to place is that they chop down the agriculture that's there for them to allow their cows to graze freely. Uh, and then when that's done, they then move to another place in order to allow them to graze freely there by chopping down that form of agriculture. So a lot of times what ends up happening, uh, free range grazing is predicated on the deforestation that has taken place as a prior precursor. And so even if free range grazing is an option uh, that could be sustainable now, it would still require us to decrease meat consumption from what current human levels are at, because current human levels are at a, a, a level that requires massive factory farming for the amount of land that exists, versus being able to move away from that so that way the couple of grazing pastures that are left are sustainable and we don't have to create more and more pastures uh, to be utilized. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, yeah. you, talking about the uh, subject blah, 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 one after another, one after another, and analyze things on a whole lot of different levels at once. It's very hard to follow. That said, one of the things that you keep bringing up is the problems of capitalism. Big problem because it, it rewards those who are greedy and, and overconsumption and so on. It's, it's a very important thing we ought to look at because we're destroying the earth with capitalism. We're also destroying people with capitalism you know, you have to have the lump and proletariat to run the system because you've got to have desperately poor people. That said, why not look at the problem of overpopulation on this planet? If we were to bring the population down in a humane way, we'd have to look at how to do that. Um, but, you know, usually pe when people are able to use birth control, they do. Maybe there would be a lot more variety in terms of sustainable agriculture if we weren't having to feed, what is it, 7 billion people now? I don't even know. Every time I look, it's another billion. Um, maybe we ought to think about some things like that. I mean, you talk about, I mean, using the Maasai tribes in Africa, I don't think it's a fair example of, because that system evolved when there were not a lot of people there to use that land, and so it probably works if there aren't a lot of people. It's when you, you're doing these things on mass scale, cutting down rainforests in Brazil, that's a problem. So I, I think you know we need to kind of focus, focus discussion, one level or another, and and try to look at these problems a bit more concretely. Yeah, I mean, I certainly, I certainly agree with, agree with you. Like, I think that. Uh, overpopulation is an issue. I generally tend to shy away from overpopulation uh, my speeches a little bit because of the way that it often gets utilized by people in sort of like racist ways because I think that it's not just overpopulation but it's like population times affluence. So like more people consuming in non-affluent areas does not necessarily recreate the same amount of environmental destruction of consumption within a first world uh, area. So like one person's consumption within America is generally a lot greater than one person's consumption in Africa, given these sort of resources, resource distributions. And so I think that there is certainly a need to restrict population growth, and I think exactly what you point out, we gotta find a way to do it within an ethical way, where it's not targeting certain populations who are undesirable in order to you know, try and decrease population, but look to sort of how we do it. And so I think that uh, you know what I was getting into at the start is like, instead of trying to come up with rationalist discourse for what is the problem, figuring out how we relate to one another in order to produce a discourse in which we could help scale back uh, the types of populations that are most destructive to the environment and help scale back those consumption problems and then from there, then begin to worry about it. And so I do agree, like that's why Maasai people do not make my initial speech, but I use an example of how like indigenous farming is not always perfect um, because I, I tend to want to put the focus on our consumption patterns rather than <coughs> other others' consumption patterns. And so you're right to a large extent that that example is not a perfect example, but it's also a situation where we could start beginning to expand how we relate to others in this sort of situation. Could you give us an example of this? Uh, I mean, you're, you're very wordy and you're very rational. I'd like to know what the non-rational form of relatedness 
I think you're one of the few people who ever said that I was rational. <laughs> um, so um, I would say that the, the examples of this is uh, the, the poem at the start and the end of my speech. Like there's not like a rationally contained argument within there, but as a way to connect with people emotionally, to open up this space for us to relate with one another in order for us to be able to, instead of being like, this causes this, but what are the emotions that bind us together? And then the other thing is like, uh, you know, the criticism you make is that I'm dot, 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 running through a bunch of different ways to approach in different ways. I think to some way that also breaks down sort of the rationalist discourse because it gives people different tidbits that they can use and that they connect with. That whereas if it's a single strand of thought with a single relationship A to B, that it's only going to connect to audiences within a certain who who identify and agree with that one argument. But when there is a bunch of different things, people will take out what they that what they like, what relates to them, and then sort of either disregard those other parts or sort of bracket that for another another understanding another day. And so I think that well, I think certainly science is useful if we only talk to one another through that scientific discourse. I don't think that's necessarily enough to be able to convince people. But clearly, there's so much science that says global warming is an issue. Yet so many people still think it is not an issue because they're just unwilling to listen to the science because that's not what's going to convince them at the end of the day. They're sort of figuring out a way that we can intimately connect to them in terms of like, the personal politics. Like, we're already experiencing the problems of global warming. When scientists make it about the ecological catastrophe that ends the world, people think it's just an apocalyptic threat opposed to something that's already influencing people who live on the margins. And so, Bringing the focus back to that and those sort of images, I think, is oftentimes more productive in influencing change than sort of bringing it into a larger scale of global uh, global context. Well, you know, eliminating animal agriculture, I think, would bring hardship to many people around the world. I mean, the the, the most widely consumed ruminant meat is the goat. I mean. I can't see taking goats away from people who, you know, live in a subsistence situation without that goat, they would starve. You know, ruminants provide food for humans where humans cannot get food. And what I'm really referring to is that, you know, uh, uh, producing grain to feed to ruminants is nonsensical. Okay. But ruminants have the ability to take cellulose and turn it into food for humans. Humans cannot digest cellulose. So that, that, that's a whole realm of producing food for humans where otherwise there was not so I have you know, a major problem with the conception of eliminating animal agriculture. Industrial animal agriculture, sure. But you know, subsistence animal agriculture, absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say uh, quickly in response to that is like, that's where it gets back to where you know, people in my situation and people in first world context shouldn't be putting and viewing people who are living in subsistent areas of the world, putting the blame on them versus putting the blame on sort of what we're doing and what we're participating with. So I think it, a lot of it's a question of like, the people here within this room, the people, a lot of people who you know exist on the university or in a lot of other sort of like personal contexts do have the ability to choose to not have to kill animals in order to survive. And so I think it's a different question when you go to a subsistence location where those, those availabilities aren't sort of the, the practice. But in terms of like the United States or local chapters creating environmental policy, it becomes important to not take those examples and then universalize it in a first world context where there is different options that we could then make of them. You've had a question for a while, right? Yeah, I guess um, I just wanted to, first of all, say that um, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I really appreciate the compassion that you're bringing to the conversation because it's something that um, we tend to, I th think we're all sort of um, hardened to that. And even p individuals who focus on local diets tend to maybe not go to the farm and meet the animals that they're going to later then ingest. Um, however, I think that, um, you know, historically we've been 
utilizing the animal agriculture for almost as long as we've had civilization, so 10,000 years. And that's something that we have evolved with. And um, I think that the, the decision on how to utilize animals is a very personal one for each individual. Um, but I have to agree that, that there are ways to do it that are more ecological and more holistic than a CAFO. And I would argue also that a, a vegan diet or even a vegetarian diet is really, in the long run, not sustainable. And that's for a number of reasons. But the first is that you're relying on monocultures of grains that have, in a holistic sense, taken away animal habitat and provide nothing and in fact poison the landscapes that they exist in. Um, and to, to have everyone rely on that is also unsustainable because it is intensive in terms of fossil fuel resources. And those fossil fuel resources are not going to last. And, um, and some of those fossil fuel resources are turned into um, pesticides and chemicals that are then washed out in our watersheds and dead zones in, in the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. So it, it really is unsustainable ecologically. And I think that, that you can appreciate that seeing as though you're arguing for a, a holistic relationship for humans to have with nature. And I can say from my personal experience and my personal path, I've been a vegetarian and I have been reintroduced to the world of eating meat. And I had a, a very personal experience of slaughtering my own hens last week, and it was exceptionally hard. Um, but I think that there is a way to utilize animals in our systems that is holistic. And I don't know if you've heard of permaculture or forest gardening, but there are ways to raise pigs in a forest. There's actually a hickory nut called the pig nut and that's because people used to raise pigs underneath the forest. And it is important to, to not think of every single landscape in our lives as something that can be exploited. And that's true, like in national parks and national forests, they're great for that, parks more so than the forest because they're logged repetitively. But the fact remains that we do live on a planet with seven billion people and we are in a position where we need to come up with a solution that um, will work. And I think ideally for all of us to live on a, in a vegetarian world would be wonderful. And without being hunter-gatherers, um, I think it's impossible at this point with 7 billion people. And I certainly don't think that it's good to maintain that population or increase it in any way. However, there are ways to incorporate the landscape with animals that actually help improve the landscape. For example, animals' nutrient cycle. And we can't do that, particularly when we're flushing our waste down the toilet. So an animal on my property is going to bring resources back up the hill, where otherwise it would wash down and be gone forever. Um, and that's an important part of our ecosystems that we have lost. Um, how far people want to take that, whether they want to harvest their chickens after they're no longer producing eggs, it's a personal decision. But we've also evolved with animals partially because they provide for us things that we can't get in a vegetarian diet. Unfortunately, we don't often eat those things in our culture as it stands, but liver and organ meats, um, bone broths provide nutrients for us. And particularly in the Northeast, they provide nutrients for us that get us through a hard winter and when, when there are no greens to be found locally. So I guess I'm, I'm in favor of a local diet and a conscious diet, and I think that, that choosing to eat locally also addresses a lot of the other issues that you've mentioned, like we can support our community gardens, and we can support ethical treatment of animals and laborers, um, and fair, fair wages, and integrated environments that aren't monocrops, and for me that's good enough. So. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with a lot, you know, almost everything that you end up saying. I think that though vegetarianism is monocropping, that's more of how it's done than how it could be done, I think is a lot of the situation. So there is another, there's another style of 
that could be sustainable, but it's not what we're set up to do, which is why in terms of like when I teach my students about these iterations, like, oh, I don't want to eat meat anymore, but I don't know how else to be sustainable, I point to local farmers, I point to CSAs and different ways where they could go to the farms and feed the animals and they can at least have what they believe to be sort of more humane sort of situations. Because I think that in terms of creating that compassionate lens, part of it is like, as I said, recognizing that we're, we are gonna have failures on this way, but you know, we shouldn't let that failure be everything about it. And so when someone chooses to then eat meat that is locally sourced, it's not that I then view them as like, fundamentally vile and evil person, but that I don't understand the, the conclusion that then I, I, it makes sense to then kill the, kill, kill the animal in order to be able to take them. I think that a lot of the nutrients can be taken from, from other animals, and I do think that even in the world of where we're not e eating local greens, that it is still in terms of the current environmental practices better to ship greens to the Northeast than to to utilize the types of farming that, that I was indicting in my speech. Um, but the other thing is like, I, you mentioned some points that the, the, the choosing to kill the animal at the end of the day is a, is a personal one. And it is certainly personal, but I think like the feminist mantra that the personal is political is also relevant in this case. Because the decision to kill is not one that would just affect you, it literally means the end of another life. And so I think that it can't be understood as a purely personal choice, it has to be understood as a relational choice to that other living creature and then what sort of those messages send to society. And I think that if we understand the personal is political, it becomes easier for me to understand your personal choice and become a reason for why I would not necessarily be like, you're an evil person, but at the same point allows you to understand my, under my position of how it's also a political choice that is wrapped up with larger issues of how we treat and interact with the world. And I think that when we forefront, and this is why I think it's so important to forefront that emotionality and the ethos of these conversations versus the logos of the conversations, it makes it easier for when we disagree on elements that some, at some points become incompatible, we're able to sort of see the vantage points that other people bring to one another when it versus when it becomes just about here's my science and here's your science, then there can't be sort of that mutual meeting ground because we're just sort of like, this is true, no, this is true, and then it becomes more combative where I'm looking to either demonize you or vice versa opposed to figuring out, okay, where are the points of the connection? Because, right, I assume that most people in this audience are not pro-factory farming, even if some people might occasionally eat at a restaurant. But the way is figuring out, I think it's more important to figure out the overlaps for where we can work together, because while the animal liberationist movement is not allies with the environmentalists in every instance, they are way more closer to allies than the people who exist controlling, you know, animal agriculture at large, as well as, like, uh, vegetarian agriculture fact that like you know so many different meat companies as they realized people were just eating vegetarian bought up vegetarian farms and then took it over with their practices is sort of proof of that and so we need to despite differences sort of come together to figure out how do we stop that sort of larger you know utilitarian logic that allows for that domination of the planet and other animals and so I think the difference becomes on where we end up creating that starting point um, and I think that we could both have different starting points and then continuously work together to make those forms of, of and then 
going to the local farmers if that's what makes sense. Because I, I do have friends that are local boars, but then I see them eating meat at restaurants, and I'm like, I thought you only ate meat. And they're like, oh, I only buy meat from you know local <coughs> farmers, but it's like, but they're not, and they go to a restaurant. So I think like in this audience it becomes interesting because it, that's sort of like where the small distinctions and differences sort of come to the forefront. Um, so yeah, that's why there's not a huge talk about like factory farming being bad because the assumption that people here are already important. We, we are going to wrap it up, um, but if there's any more questions than I. I have one, but I see a hand. So. I just, I was just thinking about your comment, Amy, about um, you know looking at models where animals are more, um, where they're they have more autonomy in terms of their own existence and how we're looking at that model. But I think, I mean, I think we can ultimately agree that the level at which we're eating animal products right now, we cannot sustain that long term. We we have to reduce our consumption drastically. And then at that point, because even if we're looking at models like that, we cannot sustain, sustain that for our global population at the rate that we're consuming animal, animal products right now. And also, Jerry, thinking about your comment about subsistence farming, a lot of that has to do with global politics and um, power and decision making. And people that are subsistence farmers are subsistence farmers because of land um, land grabs or disbursement or something, you know, that people are forced into that situation. It's not necessarily a choice and that, and I, I think that's what you're sort of talking about is that we could be looking at other models where people have more control in terms of the way that they're, they're generating food and creating food, and which is also a question of food sovereignty, right? Thinking about how we as a global community are responsible for the food systems that we're creating. And we as food consumers are always, that there is a disconnect between the food that we're consuming and, and the people that are creating the food, or that we're not creating our own food more and, and being more responsible and accountable for the food that we're creating and how that food gets to us or who's, who's creating the food and the impact that it has on other beings at the same which I think is what we're all thinking about, or maybe just from different perspectives. You uh, refer to animal poetics, and how is that different from animal liberation, or are they pretty much the same? Uh, I, I mean, I think there's a difference. Like, you know, Peter Singer's book is Animal Liberation, and the way that he addresses it is through, you know, a very sort of like ableist worldview where sentience is Probably said that. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> uses logic to come up with that. And like Barry Francione is another one who is like it's all or nothing, you're with us or against us type mentality. And the, the emphasis on poetics versus politics, uh, while it leads to political results, is about not having that sort of like black and white dichotomy in terms of the decision making that we do, but sort of recognizing the exceptions and how we have to continuously struggle together. Whereas like Barry Francione will say something that people who eat meat are experiencing a moral schizophrenia because it's fundamentally inconsistent. Not only do I think that language of like labeling that as schizophrenic is, you know, belittling and insulting to people who are actually, you know, who have schizophrenia, but I also think it's 
we do have refreshments thanks to Vivian, and don't forget those calendars. Steve brought something.